Right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Antonieta Contreras. Antonieta, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Awesome. So Antonietta, a former banker, originally educated as a mathematician, is a trauma psychotherapist who graduated with a master's in social work from NYU. After forming her clinical skills as a gestalt therapist and training at agencies with highly traumatized people, she received a specialization in trauma studies from the Institute of Contemporary Psychotherapies and in Human Sexuality from NYU School of Medicine. Antonietta maintains a private practice where she combines different trauma modalities as well as the contemplative techniques that she learned from studying within Buddhist traditions. Her book, Traumatization and its Aftermath, a Systemic Approach to Understanding and Treating Trauma Disorders, received the award for the best book of 2023 in the category of Psychology Mental Health Division by the American Book Fest. Antonietta, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So before we get going, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. I was born in Mexico City and I live in New York City now. Big cities. Okay. 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 So this book, we're going to talk about this book today. This is very comprehensive. I mean, you pack a lot in here and in a very interesting way. So let's start. Why, what was the impetus for, for writing this? Um, two main things. One was that I've been teaching, was teaching for several years, the foundation of uh, the trauma studies uh, program, um, a postgraduate um, program for clinicians. And um, I I really went into the research of uh, what it means to be traumatized. And I discovered every year, I taught for several years, that every year there were new findings and new findings and more understanding and different perspectives, different options. Like even last week, a very important finding came out about um, memory, how Mm -hmm. memories get that actually are not memories. Uh, So kind of many of the, principles that we use in some of our techniques are going to be redefined because of these findings. So that's what I noticed, that there were findings all the time that were really changing the conversation about what trauma was and that many people had stayed in the original description of uh, fight, flight, and uh, simple things mm-hmm. that it has become much more complex. So that was one uh, one of the reasons uh, to include all the new findings and bring them into updating the concepts of trauma. And the second one was that um, I participate a lot in uh, platforms in um, social media or and there are so many questions about, trauma and so many misinformation and misunderstanding of what it means. And it it, uh, it breaks my heart to see that uh, people get confused, assign labels to themselves, they feel defeated and they don't, they are not going to get better. So I, I answer a lot of these questions and I notice that there was the need to to solidify all those answers in a book that responds to all these questions that people have. So give us an example of one such bit of misinformation that people might have. You mentioned a couple of things, but share with us. Well, for example, um, the New York Magazine a couple of months ago, I think, or last month, came with a cover says, Trauma, America's a uh, favorite diagnosis, right? So right there, trauma is not a diagnosis, for instance, right? 
but uh, it's our favorite one. <laughs> so yeah. what's going on? What is what is the diagnosis? What is the injury? What is the disorder? Instead of like calling trauma everything from the event, many people say, oh, the trauma that somebody gave me. Like trauma is not something that people give you, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, it's an injury that your nervous system goes through or your whole system goes through uh, when you confront situations that are extremely dangerous or activating and you can't handle them. Mm -hmm. So um, so trauma is not the event, trauma is not only the injury, trauma is not the diagnosis, trauma is not the reaction, trauma is not, it's, it's many things, right? So that is an example. Mm -hmm. Okay. You also, prior to that, you mentioned something about fight and flight and saying it's not really that simple. Expand yeah. on that, please. Yeah. Well, I... I really make emphasis in my book about post-traumatic and peritraumatic mechanisms that we have because the fight or flight normally describes um, a stress. Like we all experience fight or flight when we get angry, for example, but that doesn't mean that the survival circuits are activated or that we are fearing for our lives, right? Um, and even, even so, when we get really scared, some mechanisms uh, start getting activated, but then once the danger goes away, there are other things that happen to the system, the post-traumatic, let's say, that we adopt as a strategies. I also make the differentiation into preventive and uh, protective mechanisms at the, the peritraumatic ones, because for instance, freeze, is a um, mechanism that people confuse whether it comes after fight, flight, freeze, mm -hmm. that comes after uh, the fight, right? Um, and that is not really freeze. Well, people call it that. But there is a preventive mechanism that actually paralyzes us in a rigid way before the fight and flight uh, mechanism gets activated because we need... Um, that time to really understand the level of danger before we act. And then after the fight or flight, the immobilization comes that are very different in terms of what happens, what is happening to us. And in freeze in is rigidity, in immobilization is a loss of tone or muscle tone and etc. And they need different interventions. We need to understand mm. the differences between them in order for us to help the clients that take that strategy as, um, as a survival uh, way to cope with their lives, right? So a rigid person is very different, needs very different interventions than a dissociated person that comes mm -hmm. with mobilization, right? So those uh, little differences are very important in terms of how we treat our clients. So in terms of the book, how did you organize the book? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it took me like a, um, a lot of work to organize it because there is so much information that I needed to share. So first, the, the part one, I wanted to talk about the whole neurobiology and all the consequences and all the elements that take uh, part, have a role into this, like emotions and uh, memory and all these that I call them um, trauma domains that get affected, right? So I, I, I explain the process, I explain the neurobiology, I explain all the mechanisms. And then in part two, I separated the different types of traumatization of the traumatization is the process that it starts when we get really act, uh, uh, afraid, scared, shocked, uh, surprised, like really is afraid of our lives, right? To, um, to the moment that we resolve the fear of the, or, or the belief that we can lose our integrity or our lives, that process can be short or can be prolonged for a very, very long time if we keep thinking or feeling uh, that we are in danger because the brain recognizes those signals as the cue to stay in survival mode, right? So um, the second part 
uh, I want I wanted to be very specific on um, the types of alterations that our system goes through with each one of the different ways to get traumatized from uh, day one to, for instance, complex trauma. Like people talk about PTSD and CPTSD, complex PTSD, right? Complex PTSD includes everything that it, uh, means prolonged or repeated uh, sense of threat uh, or danger, right? But it's very different if you get it uh, young at one or a three or a seven mm -hmm. or a 20 or a 60, right? There are differences in when do you get that type of prolonged, because it doesn't mean like there are people that have good childhood, but then they have a bad relationship uh, and then they endure years of abuse. They were healthy, but that endurance starts um, affecting Mm -hmm. their nervous system little by little and of course the consequences are different than if you have to endure it when you are two years old right, right. so i wanted to separate all the different types of um ways we can get traumatized and their effects so if it's attachment thing before we are born or at birth or if it's a social and uh, institutionalized oppression, or if it's, I separated, for instance, abuse from neglect, normally they put it together. So I have separation, separated them because abuse has different consequences in the system than neglect, for instance, right? So I try to dissect as much as possible the different reasons we can get traumatized and I separated them um, in uh, the reasons and the consequences. Wow. Let's let's highlight that for a little bit, abuse and neglect. Talk a little bit about how they're different and how they, uh, with the understanding that it impacts people differently, of course. Right. Well, abuse, abuse is a, a, a frontal, um, how we call it? It, it, it asks for a reaction right away right right away if if i scream at you you have to react there with aggression or with uh, avoidance right mm -hmm. and it's easier to identify the wound if it's um abuse than if it's neglect because neglect there are many other elements that can play um a part on the traumatization or not some people are neglected and are actually not traumatized. They mm -hmm. learn to cope. They may internalize certain ideas about themselves, um, but they don't fear for their survival. So the, the survival mechanisms don't get activated the same way as if somebody is hitting you, mm -hmm. or, right? Or punishing you or, or insulting you. So um, I, I want to normalize, but also to the pathologize trauma that not everybody that was even abused or neglect developed trauma mm -hmm. and when i why we could develop a trauma disorder from the circumstances so for instance if you get neglected and then you develop a huge sense of shame for the neglect that you internalize it in that way that could be the trigger for you mm. to to, to activate those circuits. But then the intervention, again, is very different than somebody that gets angry and immediately fight back. The neglected person with shame is not going to fight back, is going to probably dissociate, and the intervention needs to go into the shame, not into the fear first, right? Um, so things like that. All right, let's um, remind everyone we're speaking with Antonieta Contreras. The book is called Traumatization and Its Aftermath, A Systemic Approach to Understanding and Treating Trauma Disorders. We'll be back in one second. Hang on. All right. So when I speak with you, Antonieta, I realize how much there is to know and understand about. I mean, when you started researching for the, this book, 
it just seems like there's a wealth of information. Is there a lot of information that a lot of people just don't know about? Mm-hmm. Yes, there is a lot because um, there are articles uh, in journals more than books, right? Uh, I think we we rely a lot on books and we right. rely a lot on uh, the dozen of people that talk about one topic and then we hear the same idea over and over and over again and it's kind of it programs the mm. the way of thinking about certain things but um but we need to be actualized and and put together things like we we in psychology we still use a very medical model and if you think about medicine well the cardiologist has nothing to do with your stomach right mm-hmm. for example so a little bit like that Sometimes in psychology, you either take care of the memories or you take care of the thoughts, for mm-hmm. right? And now you take care of the body and uh, we don't put them together. I, I missed to mention that the third part of the book is about a model to apply all these modalities that is integrative because the integration of um, all our parts is essential for us to heal, right? Uh, sometimes, for instance... Let's say we we are processing memories, so we are talking or using cognition with a person that doesn't have a sense of self developed or is very weak. The work is kind of going into the ether because there is no self that can take in the ideas or the progress of mm. the of the uh, interventions or the treatment. So we need to develop a sense of self first for having someone to observe themselves and have, have reflective capacities on uh, on what is going on internally, right? So that integration. So that, that I think that uh, way of seeing things is not very popular. We are not used to put together things. And that's what I was trying to do in the book to put together. Uh, rejection is a very interesting thing, for instance. Um, is there kind of very separated from the trauma world. And uh, it's essential to understand attachment injuries, right? Because the main injury is this sense, this is uh, um, rejection sensitivity that people develop, that that is what becomes the fear, right? The danger is to be rejected, the threat. So I brought that theory the rejection uh, sensitivity theory into the book to put it together with the other parts that we have um, as a way to understand the, the big picture. I mean, you obviously and clearly have such a passion for this. How did this develop? The passion? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I have been always very passionate <laughs> in general, like it's part of my traits, right? And my, I, I also include all the, the, the chemicals and the neurobiology of um, temperament, for example, right? If you produce more serotonin than dopamine, it's, you have different traits or whatever. But yeah, I, I have always been very, very energetic and very passionate. And um, I saw suffering. Uh, as a Buddhist, I, I understood that uh, it's, it's not the discipline only, it's not the hope only, it's not the faith only, it's, it needs many more things. And the support of a community, for instance, in Buddhism, emotions, and in other religions, I'm also Catholic, and in Catholicism, being angry or experiencing envy is a sin for example, mm-hmm. right? Or in Buddhism, it's a, it's a delusion. And um, at some point, I realized that we as humans need to embrace those emotions in order for us to be healthier emotionally. And if we didn't, we were just going to continue suffering them and being ashamed of even having emotions because we are humans. So all my, and then the suffering in, in, uh, in all sorts of environments, right? Like uh, people suffer in different ways um, and it all affects, it all get affected. 
So yeah, I would like, I, I want to, I would like to, I want to continue helping and having the hope that I can continue helping people and that more people need help. One of the reasons I became uh, a, a teacher was to train trauma therapists for, for, for them to be more of, of us uh, com- helping people overcome this, this ugly place we live in when we don't get out of the trauma, right? Of the traumatization, this darkness, this uh, uh, loss of hope, this de- sense of defeat that is characteristic of um, a person that keeps in survival mode. So we need to be more of us. We need to have more awareness. We need to really battle that and uh, make people more functional and more like uh, capable of being happy. So who is the book for? Is it for just basically anyone who wants to learn about trauma? Is it specifically for mental health clinicians who want to learn about trauma? I debated uh, in which direction to go. And then I sold the book to a publisher that uh, publishes textbooks, right? So um, I, I it's, it's both. I like the idea that uh, the therapist reads it and then share it with the client, maybe a chapter, maybe two, for them to understand certain things. I believe in psychoeducation. Psychoeducation is essential to heal. Uh, If we don't know what is going on with us, we judge ourselves and we don't get over it. So um, I think it's a very nice psychoeducation tool, but I already have a couple of new clients and several calls consultations from people, lay people that have read the book and that are finding a lot of um, help in reading it. So it's for both people, for both sectors. In terms of um, uh, trauma treatment, what are your thoughts on how, excuse me, on the, on the current state of trauma treatment modalities? You were saying you know, many therapists now are learning from the books that are coming out, the popular books that are coming out from the 12 popular people. Mm-hmm. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So in response to that, what do you, how do you feel uh, in terms of the trauma treatment modalities out there? Are they adequate? Are people learning enough or, or what? All of them are useful. Um, people need to also know why they uh, are useful and when they are useful, right? Um, if they don't understand the the difficulties that the person has and the parts that need to be treated, they can jump into one modality, skipping many steps that if they are not treated, they are not going to have successful treatments. Mm-hmm. Right. So, for instance, um, neurofeedback is an amazing tool for regulation, but it doesn't help um, with processing. EMDR is a great tool for processing or somatic experiencing for processing, but they don't are are not focusing on regulation Mm -hmm. and you need both elements. But on on top of that, what I I think is that um, the treatment needs to be understood as dynamic. So um, today we have a model that um, was first proposed by, hmm, escaping right now his name, but hundred years ago, Janet. Janet proposed a model for trauma that then uh, Judith Herman adapted, adopted and adapted, and then Ford and several others, but it's a linear. Uh, model, right? Is um, stabilization, re- uh, reprogram, no, um, processing and reprogramming. And it never happens that way. Mm. We need to use a dynamic model that uh, sees what is required and starts, I said, building blocks, start using building blocks for the alterations and the domains we need to work on in order to build the the foundation for a a successful treatment. So that is also an important thing. People need to understand what they are doing before applying a modality because a modality alone is not gonna make the the trick. 
And that's a, I think that's a good example that trauma treatment modality uh, is, is that was put forth by Judith Herman uh, is still used today very commonly, as you're saying. And people need to understand that it's not going to go linearly like that. It's much more dynamic. So as a result, uh, are, are you saying that clinicians need to or therapists need to just study more? modalities well first my book <laughs> because the book is going to tell them what uh, trauma treatment should move like right and right. then choose the modalities that resonate more with them and know how they should be applied for certain things for instance i do adjunct work sometimes for emdr if somebody has their therapist and they have been uh developing a relationship and that's wonderful but at the moment that they are stable and need to process they could be sent to a different therapist to work on those pieces uh or that part of the treatment for instance, if somebody is not good at uh, developing self and doesn't understand that, well, maybe you find a colleague that is specialized in that type of modality, or you learn it, right? But you mm -hmm. need to you need to have a broader understanding of what it needs to be um, done for the person to recover. Uh, personality disorders, for instance, right? Um, you cannot go and process memories when they don't even know where they are, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different level of understanding of what happened to them that made them adapt into that type of behavior and uh, regulation that needs to be addressed as such. Awesome. The book is called Traumatization and its Aftermath, a Systemic Approach to Understanding and Treating Trauma Disorders. If you're a mental health clinician and interested in trauma or working with trauma, you need to get this book. We'll have the links up at the show notes page here at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. And on Antonieta, they can get it at your website, obviously, mm -hmm. which is what? AntonietaContreras.com. Okay, and we'll have that linked up as well. Antonietta, so inspiring. Um, this book is a game changer. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for, for being here and sharing your inspiration with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. Ciao. Sure.